Amen. Now, I want to turn your attention to Isaiah chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. Isaiah 6, beginning at verse 1. And I'm going to read down to verse 8. Amen. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting up on a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twine they covered their faces, with twine they covered their feet, and with twine that he did fly. And one cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, who the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he, said, and he laid it up on my mouth and said, Lo, this had touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Notice us. Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Amen. And I simply just want to lift from this, this thought. I'll go. I will go. I remember some 37 years ago, I vowed to the Lord these very words. And after I had accepted uh, Christ and learned of, of Jesus, when he gave the exhortation in Matthew, he said, Pray ye that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers into the vineyard, for the labor, the harvest is right and the labors are few. I began to pray that prayer. And I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go where you want me to go. And I'll say what you want me to say and I'll be what you want me to be. Use me, Lord, as an instrument in your service. And 37 years later, I still pray that prayer. For the harvest is still truly ripe. And as Billy Graham said, the destinies of men are being decided every day. God will not hold us responsible for the past generation. And he won't hold us totally responsible for the next generation. But he said we do have our generation that he will hold us responsible for. And so... I prayed that prayer, and at that time, I had no deep, intimate understanding of who God was, and I didn't know how to count the cost. But now I still pray that prayer, and now I have drank deep into the intimate experiences of God, and I do know what the cost of it is. And I do know that God's comprehensive and eternal plans and purposes will be carried out whether or not we are willing to say I'll go or whether we are unwilling. So in our text this morning, beloved, uh, the prophet Isaiah needed to drink deep into who God is to be able to say I'll go. Here am I. Send me. It wasn't that he wasn't a prophet already. But he needed to experience a deeper connection. Uh, so that 
he would not be hesitant and he would be confident when he confront all of those in whom God was giving the message to. Every one of the prophets, some seven contemporaries of Isaiah, some before him, all had the same problem. People were not listening to what God was saying. People were not taking God at his word. They were not, they just was not believing what the prophets were saying. And so until Isaiah drank deep into an intimate experience with God, he moved very hesitantly. And I think that, that says the same thing to us today. We move cautiously and hesitantly because we have not yet reached that deep connection of who God really is. Isaiah had a tough crowd. Back when I used to watch the Apollo, I don't know what they call it, I just know at the Apollo Theater, where up and young artists try to get their start, and they said if you could get past the Apollo, you could make it, because that was a hard crowd. Well, I thought about that when I say, Isaiah must have been dealing with a crowd like that. Because they wasn't listening. People like Elijah and Elisha, they had preached to a rough crowd, but with no lasting results. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and Michael, and Nahum, contemporaries of Isaiah, had preached with no lasting results. And may I add, none of these men were dying to get on the bandwagon of prophets because they knew how tough the job was. But like Isaiah, once they experienced who God really is, then they all would be able to say, I'll go. Send me. The year was around 739 B.C. Uzziah had just died. Uzziah was a good king. He followed in the ways of his fathers. He was a righteous ruler. But then Uzziah got in trouble. According to 2 Chronicles 26, Uzziah tried to exercise the duties of a priest, which was forbidden to anyone that was not a Levitical priest. See, our gifts, beloved, today ought to be used in obedience Unto what God has called us to do. Not for sinful pride. Not for people to sing our praises. Not to be lifted up on a pedestal. See pride. uh, Pride is what got us out. This righteous king. had, had, Had ruled. For some 30 years. And then in the end. He had to live in seclusion. Because God made him a leper. One who was used to having. 50 councilmen in his attendant lived out his dying days all alone because of pride. You do know pride is what got Satan kicked out of heaven. See, so let us not be so prideful. God endow us with gifts and skills. And it's not to say that because of your gift put you on stage and somebody else's gift may put them in the background, that you have a better gift, but it's to recognize what God has blessed you with and use it according to his glory. Use them according to his glory. And so, so once our zeal experienced who God really is, he could say, I'll go, send me. See, after our zeal fell from grace, us our, fell from grace, his son Jotham became the ruler. At this point, the Lord said, I need a special ruler because Jotham was not a righteous man. He was not a man that was going to follow in his daddy's footsteps. And the nation was already in trouble from idol worship. And so God called Isaiah Not for the first time. He was already called and saved, but he needed to give him a fresh uh, uh, connection with his commission of what he wanted him to do. 
And so, so he, Isaiah needed a different perspective, a different perspective. See, before he looked at God from earthly point of view, but now the Lord was going to give him a heavenly point, a point of view, a more broader perspective, a more fuller perspective, and a deeper perspective. So Isaiah sees the Lord as we today ought to see him, high and lifted up, where uh, God's glory and his robe fills the entire temple. It's what Isaiah seen. See, Isaiah sees the Lord kind of like Paul and John when they was caught up into heaven themselves. They seen God as supreme ruler sitting on the throne. Isaiah wasn't in Solomon's temple when he seen God. He was in heaven's temple when he seen the Lord. And he, and he recognized that maybe a great king on earth had fallen, but the king in heaven was still on the throne, and he was still sovereign, and he was still ruler. Isaiah loved his cousin, Uzziah. He loved his family. And... He had become saddened at Uzziah's death. How many of you know that the Lord will see us through when we're going through rough patches, turbulence in this life, when death invade our ranks and take away a loved one? God will see us through. It's not our faithfulness. It's not our own means that help us get through when we're weak and lonely, but God, our Father, in sad hours, will see us through. And may I say to you this, that when your outlook becomes bleak, look up. When dark days and cloudy nights invade your ranks, look up. When it seems like you're taking two steps forward and three steps backwards, you need to stop and look up. When worry and frustrations comes into your life, to what seems like an endless visit, you need to stop and look up. And when you have sunk so low uh, in the abyss until seed weeds are wrapped all around your head, I tell you, it's time to look up. And you can say like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. For Job said, all of my divinely appointed days, I'm going to wait until my change come. And, 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 and I heard David say in Psalms 37, I would have fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of God. He kept me from falling, sustained my life, and kept me through life storms. Look at your neighbor and tap him and say, look up when sad times come. Isaiah say, when I looked up, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I couldn't see him uh, personally because the, the, the temple was full of smoke. But he made me know that it was he who was sitting on the throne. And I saw, I saw his majestic robe, how it filled the whole temple. Can I tell you this morning, just a glimpse of God is all you need. After all, we couldn't endure more than a glimpse of God. Moses begged to see the glory of God, only to shelter himself in the cleft of the rock and hide behind the hand of God. Peter, James, and John, the Lord put them to sleep on the Mount of Transfiguration because they were not able to look upon the magnificent glory of God. John, on the Isle of Patmos, when Christ uh, uh, appeared unto him, John said, I fell down like a dead man in the presence and the glory of Christ. You see, beloved, visions of God are revealed in measured degrees. It is according to your obedient walk do God reveal himself unto you. To God let you experience the holiness that Isaiah is experiencing. Because obedience is still better than sacrifices. 
prophet said, I saw seraphim, angelic beings that appear like fire. And, 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 and uh, as they appear like fire, they was on fire for God. They, they were burning with zeal for the Lord. They were burning with love for God and standing ready and willing to do whatever God would require them. They represented his holiness, his sanctification, his purity. And he described them as having six wings, six pair of wings. With two wings, they covered their face. Because even the angels could not stand in the presence and the glory of God. With two wings, they covered their feet in humility. And with two wings, they did fly. And as they passed before the throne of God, they cried one to the other, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God upon his throne. And they said his glory, the earth was full of his glory. Now, that, that, that's intriguing that the earth is full of his glory. It kind of lets you know what David said in Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the earth show his artistic created furnishing of the earth through the trees, through the oceans, through the mountains, through the animals, through the people. All that shows the glory of our Father. And that's what these seraphims said, uh, that the whole earth was full of the glory of God. And I want you to know that Isaiah didn't say they sounded good, but he said they sounded the same. They were together on one accord, in harmony, worshiping as one. I think that ought to let us know something. If these holy ones that have never known sin bow their heads in the presence of the Almighty and recognize that oneness and unity is what God desires, to be able to worship him the way he's supposed to be worshiped, then I think that we ought to walk in unity and in harmony. They sang of the Trinity, contributed holiness to the Father, holiness to the Son, and holiness to the Holy Spirit. They sang of his perfection, for three is the number of perfection. They sang the, uh, 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 cease not the same uh, day unto day, not night and day, because there ain't no night in heaven. But they cease the saying day unto day, giving praise unto God for his holiness and inexhaustible holiness. Which he say gives us reason, church, that we ought to be praising God down here. The psalmist said, Thou art, O God, the life and the light of this entire wondrous world we see. It glows by day and it smiles by night, but our reflections from, caught from thee. So wherever we turn, thy glory shine, and all things fair and bright are dying. So he said, with that, we ought to just be able to say, thank you, Lord, for your goodness, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For all your glory. Thank you, Lord, for all your resplendent work done unto the children of men. Give him praise in his house today. These seraphs, they sang. And they sang so mightily and praised so mightily. Isaiah said that the foundation shook. And the columns were moved out of their places, at their voices. These guys are really letting us know that there are no boundaries, no parameters when it comes to praising God. In other words, we got to quit being so subdued when we're praising God. You can't praise him enough because he's just that big. You can't out-praise the angels because you don't have that kind of perspective. 
So we ought to give God all that we can give him while we have a chance. The question was once asked Job, who was the wisest man in the world at that time. God asked Job, he said, Job, where were you? When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. If you have wisdom, Job, answer me. Job had to say that I had to put my hand over my mouth and not act foolishly and speak again when I recognized the glory of God. Isaiah said, I saw the temple. I saw the robe of God. I saw the seraphim. But I didn't see God. The temple was filled with smoke. So that the vision of the prophet may be prohibited. See, the Lord gave him to know that he was in his presence. Yeah. Uh, but he concealed how much the prophet would actually see. The Lord concealed him just as he conceals us from vain curiosity of making images of him. Had Isaiah seen God, he would have went out and made images. Almighty. Probably tried to draw him. So the, the Bible said the temple was filled with smoke. So Isaiah could only see a silhouette. He knew God was there. But he couldn't see like he seen the seraphims and the robe of God. And so the Lord concealed that. Lest he would delve into things that he was not supposed to delve into. And you know our curiosity would get the best of us. Amen. We would go out and start to digging into things, researching things. We're not supposed to. But a reassuring glimpse of his glory, his holiness, and a refreshing commission is what all of us need. Just like Isaiah. Why? Because we are flawed. We're all flawed. Trying to do his perfect will through imperfect bodies. Imperfect minds, imperfect holiness and imperfect righteousness. We're all flawed. And all the things that we are surrounded by on this earth tend to make us lose sight of God's intended purpose. I mean, Abraham lost sight of his divine purpose when he lied to Pharaoh about his wife. Moses lost sight when in frustration he struck the rock when God said, speak to the rock. David lost sight when he killed a man and took that man's wife. Amen. Jonah, Hosea, Jeremiah all lost sight for a season because uh, we are human. And pressures and frustrations of this life can weigh heavy upon you. Sometimes we see the Lord more clear than other times. Paul says we see through a glass darkly. Therefore, our goal is to take God at his word and walk by faith. Amen. There are times when the Lord lifts us up so high to a place of euphoria and ecstasy. But like Moses in the cleft of the rock or Ezekiel at Kiba's river or Paul down in Arabia or John on the Isle of Patmos, Isaiah here in Jerusalem, God will give the vision of glory so much so that it would be a life-changing influence in our life. Whatever he called us to do, right. he will empower us and enable us to do that. Yes. But that's what he wants us to do. Amen. He don't want us to do what he didn't call us to do. Amen. See, visions of glory will hold you and encourage you when you are going through. And if you didn't have that, when trouble come, you'll quit. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, outlook on earth may have been bleak, but because his beloved Uzziah had died, the nation was overrun with ruin and sin, and he had no courage to speak because he was, get this, he was a part of everything that was going on. Amen. He was a part of it. And, 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 but when he began to see things from heaven's point of view, he seen God was still on the throne and that God was still in charge 
and God the Father was still sovereign and ruler. Can I tell you that when your world has been tossed to and fro, look at the things from heaven's point of view. When you are so far down you can't get up, look at things from heaven's point of view. When Isaiah looked at things from heaven's point of view, he saw himself for the first time. And the sight of a holy God and the sounds of holy hymns brought great convictions to the prophet. He confessed all of his flaws, all of his shortcomings. I am a man of unclean lips, Lord. I live in this corruption with unclean people. And how many of us today can say to the Lord we are flawed and we have shortcomings? How many of us can even admit that? That we are flawed and have shortcomings? Unclean lips come from the heart. Matthew 12, uh, Christ told us at verse 34 and 35, for out of the mouth, or the mouth speaks what's in the heart. A good person brings good things out of the treasures of good things, but a bad person brings bad things out of the treasures of bad things. It's not from without that corrupt a man, but it's from within. And so, and so when you're speaking bad things, that's coming from your heart. Amen. When you're cursing and profaning, that's coming from your heart. Amen. And when you're running people down and talking about them, that's coming from your heart. Amen. The mouth is just doing what the heart is telling it to do. Yes. Amen. And let me say this to you, beloved. None of us can minister to others until we have let God minister to us you see when the Lord gives me a test and gives it to me very emphatically and clearly and I say yes Lord I'll go I get all excited then I become anxious to complete the task and I know with every project there will be some rough patches some setbacks some unforeseen complications. But when the pitfalls come, and in my zeal to accomplish the task, I sometimes forget to be patient. And when I forget to be patient, my frustration shows. But let me be clear, what don't happen to me is I don't become angry, just frustrated. Because one very important fact has ever before me that this is not my work. It's God's. It's not my message. It's God's. It's not my vision. It's God's. And it's not my timing. It's God's. See, 2 Chronicles 20, 15 said the Holy Spirit came upon Jaziel, the son of a Levite priest, descendant of Asaph. And he told, uh, uh, told uh, uh, Jezreel, uh, told Jehoshaphat, he said, I want you to tell Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, be not afraid, don't be discouraged concerning the vast army at his gate, for the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. And whenever God gives you a task and you're doing that task, and you start to run into opposition, don't take it personal. Remember, it's not yours, it's the Lord's. You see, you see, how many times have we heard that, I'm not gonna do that no more. I can't work with them old people. What you need to do is take a view from heaven's perspective. See, that's what Isaiah needed. God realized Isaiah needed that. Lord, I ain't got clean lips. Lord, I'm down here around all these old unclean people. I can't do it. So God had to give him a new perspective and brought him up to show him that I'm still on the throne. I'm still in charge of things. And after he got through with them, he asked a rhetorical question to the Son and the Holy Ghost. Whom can we send? And who will go for us? 
And then Isaiah, after having caught that glimpse of God's glory, he could say, here am I, Lord. Send me. Send me. So when you find yourself wanting to do for the Lord, but you just can't get the courage, take another view from heaven's perspective. And let the Lord minister to you. Amen. See, we, we just can't do it until God work with us. So Isaiah cried out, just as the psalmist did in Psalms 51 and 10. Create in me, O Lord, a pure heart. And renew in me a steadfast spirit. So like Isaiah, I'm flawed. I recognize my flaw and I confess. Isaiah needed clean lips, and he needed the virtue, and I need the virtue of patience. Therefore, I pray for it. But Isaiah still had a job to do, as do I. And so I seek his face always to please the Lord. Isaiah saw one of the seraphims get a hot coal from all the altars of heaven. And verse 7 says, he touched my lips with this burning coal and said, this has touched your lips. And now your guilt is gone and your sins forgiven. Isaiah's conviction led to confession. And his confession led to his cleansing. Did you catch that? When you recognize from the word of God or from the preaching of God or the teaching of God, uh, through conviction that you need something to confess. Your confession, your conviction will lead to confession and your confession will lead to your cleansing. For First John 1 and 9 say, he that confesses faults before the Lord, he will cleanse him from all of his faults and the blood of Christ will wash you anew. Yes, beloved, we are all flawed saints. Just as the many heroes of faith were. But what they didn't do is find fault in one another. But they confessed their own shortcomings. Abraham asked, please forgive my boldness to speak to you these many times. For I am only but a man. Jacob said, I'm not worthy of all the kindness and patience you have shown me and my family. Job said, I have spoken foolishly. I will not say anything else. David said, Lord, I'm not worthy of what you have already done for me. Paul declared, Christ came into the world to save sinners of which I am the worst. And finally, Peter said unto the Lord, go away from me, for I am a sinful man. But I got caught up by to tell you that the Lord specializes. In using rejects. In using recluses. See, don't get upset because you think you know something about your brother or sister. God specializes in using them. God said, I didn't come to the mighty. I didn't come to the high. I came to the salt of the earth. To the cross of the earth. To the meek and the lowly. And God said it is through my power that enables them to do what they're able to do. They can't do it without me. I can't do what I do without God. I don't know about you. I need the Lord. And as long as you and I are on this side of glory, we're going to have some sins to confess. And we have a job to do. And no matter what, the Lord's purposes will be done. You may not like the message, but the Lord's purpose will be done. You may not like God's direction, but his purposes will be done. You may not approve of God's reasoning, but his purpose will be done. And you may not acquiesce to his plans, but God's purposes will be done. When the Lord gave, forgave Isaiah and removed his guilt, the prophet saw a need in Judah. Verse 8 said, And I heard the Lord ask the rhetorical question, Whom shall I send? And who will our messenger be? And I answered, I said, Lord, I'll go. Amen. I'll go. He couldn't say that before. But after having been in the presence of God and witnessed 
all the resplendent glory of God, he could say, Lord, I'll go. In other words, God, God held consultation with the Son and the Holy Ghost. Uh, the, the, the Godhead of eternal wisdom and power. And it, it's not that the Lord didn't know who he was going to send. God, God, the God to whom all things are known, need not to inquire of man. But he was confirming a calling in Isaiah. For Isaiah to know what his commission was. Go to the house of Judah. Go to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and declare, thus said the Lord. And Jesus gave us a commission. He made us co-missionaries with him. Co-laborers and co-workers. Go ye into all the world and make disciples of men. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. God is saying, whom shall I send? So with his burdens lifted and his heart at peace, Isaiah volunteers. He volunteers his devotion. He pledges his Lord in faithfulness. He emerges from the shadow of reluctance to offer himself a drink offering unto the Lord. He comes out of the background to become a living sacrifice for the Lord. And may I say unto you this morning, without the Lord's confirmation of our callings, we would pause at every hint of trouble. Amen. And I'm not just talking about preachers. I'm talking about all of us and what we do. Yes. We would be hesitant at every hint of trouble. Yes. But would you notice that Isaiah didn't make excuses like Moses who said, who am I to go to Pharaoh to tell these people, to tell them that God's he let his people go? He didn't make a defense like Jeremiah saying, I ain't nothing but a child and Lord, I can't speak. Isaiah made no attempt at rationale, cop-outs, or alibis, or justification. He said, if the Lord needs somebody, here am I. Send me. The prophet says, in essence, what he said, I'm ready. Are you ready to tell the Lord this morning, I'll go? See, I'll go means that whenever, wherever, and however. I'll go means that i go where you want me to go, do what you want me to do, and say what you want me to say. You can say like the song, I'm yours, Lord, with everything I am and everything I got. And from the bottom of my heart to the depth of my soul, completely yes, my soul say yes. Not by my will, Lord, but by thy will be done. For it is no more I, but it is Christ who lives inside of me. And I'm yielding completely through and through, and I surrender my all unto you. Yes, beloved, Isaiah made himself totally available to the master. Never underestimate what the Lord can do with one willing soul who says, I'll go. The harvest is right, and the Lord needs laborers. Or uh, anyone here today uh, will become one of God's willing volunteers. For the Lord didn't woo Isaiah with a bunch of promises and blessings. Uh, he didn't promise Isaiah that miracles would follow him in his ministry. He didn't even assure him that he would show the people that he would be with them just like he did Joshua with Moses. But what he did say, Isaiah, your preaching to the blind going to make them blinder. Your preaching to the deaf would make their, their hearing more duller. And your preaching to the hard-hearted will make their hearts more callous. And Isaiah said, Lord, how long I got to do this? And the Lord said, until I say, enough is enough. And so important was those three phrases that all four gospel writers repeated them. Jesus, they asked Jesus, Lord, why are you preaching, teaching parables? He said that so that the blind, lest they see and be converted. All the hearers, lest they hear and understand. See, God say, give now what is holy unto dogs. There are those out there that don't mean God no good. All they want to do is try to get something to whip you with. 
And so God said that I will not give my word unto them. When they're ready to repent, I know their hearts. I know their hearts and I, they will, I will allow them to be able to repent. See, God doesn't deliberately nor arbitrarily make folk blind, deaf, or hard-hearted. But he says the more you resist his truth, the more you will want to have your own way. And when you want to have your own way, as opposed to God's way and God's truth, he said then that's going to make you blind, make you deaf, and make your heart hard. But he says to the faithful, he said, keep on teaching. Keep on witnessing. Keep on testifying. And keep on preaching. For I want you to know your labor won't be in vain. Uh, and the test of your faithfulness is not seen in outward success. But your faithfulness unto him may be seen uh, by your faithful walk with him. In other words, God didn't call me to be successful, but he called me to be faithful. And he told me to work until the very end. He said, make no mistake about it, somebody ain't going to hear what you're saying. Somebody ain't going to like what you're saying. Yeah. He said, but be thou faithful unto the end. Because yeah. you see, uh, the same word that caused them to become blind, yeah. same word that stopped their ears and bring uh, callousness to their heart, yeah. is the same word that's going to open their blind eyes unstop their deaf ears uh, and bring reconciliation upon this earth. Because in the end, uh, I want you to know that all had this uh, majestic vision given by the Holy Spirit. They could turn around and tell the Lord, Lord, if you need somebody, you can send me and I'll go. Moses may have been slow to speak, uh, but in the end he said, uh, I'll go. Yeah. Jeremiah may complain of being too young, but in the end he said, uh, I'll go. Yeah. And Peter always act before he thought, uh, but in the end he said, uh, I'll go. Yeah. Paul was uh, like a mob hit man, uh, but in the end he said, uh, I'll go. And I don't know what God is asking you to do. But one thing is for sure. He's asking, whom shall I send? What do you mean, preacher? Whom shall I send that can teach Sunday school? Whom shall I send that can teach vacation Bible school? Who can I send uh, encouraging couples uh, who are having marital problems? Uh, who can I send uh, to the single mother who's going through? Uh, who can I send today uh, to hold a hand uh, of a dying soul? Uh, who can I send to a friend uh, who is lonely uh, to those that are disenfranchised? Uh, that I, uh, that, 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 who can I send uh, that has knowledge and skills uh, in modern technology? Because no matter how rough it gets, no matter how difficult it is, uh, in the end, uh, they all said, uh, I'll go. See, Jesus is uh, the same yesterday, uh, the same today, uh, and they'll be the same tomorrow. And God told me that if I go, uh, he'll go with me. Uh, he said, I'll be with you uh, every step of the way. Uh, and I want you to know uh, that as he went with Isaiah, uh, God was in Jesus, reconciling the world to himself. And my God and your Lord, he died six hours one Friday 
on an old rugged cross. Uh, he took that cross, uh, went down uh, the Villa de La Rosa, up to Golgotha's hill, uh, and they crucified him. Uh, yes, they did. Uh, and my God uh, and your Lord, uh, he hanged down from the ninth hour, from the third hour to the ninth hour. And by God, in the ninth hour, he looked up in heaven uh, and he said, it is finished. Uh, least uh, I've completed everything you told me to do. Uh, I've finished all the work you told me to do. Uh, no matter how rough it got, uh, no matter how they hated me, I finished the work, Jill, uh, that you told me to do. He hanged his head in the lock of his shoulder and the Bible said, Said, uh, he gave up uh, his spirit uh, into the hands of the Father, took him and put him in a borrowed tomb. Uh, my God uh, and your Lord, uh, he stayed there all night Friday, all day Saturday, but early, 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 he got up, all oh, power in his hand, all uh, oh, power. In his hand. And this same Christ got up and after 40 days went down to the river in the Mediterranean, put himself in the fourth dimension, got up on a mystic cloud and floated away out of sight. And God sent an angel, and the angel said, you men, why stand here, you gazing at Jesus? The same Jesus that you see going away is coming back. But go ye and wait for the promise of the Father and tarry there until the Holy Ghost come. And when the Holy Ghost come, then the church will be born and you'll be able to do all that God told you to do. But you got to have that experience. You got to have that deeper experience. You got to have that burning desire and that holy fire that makes you want to do right, talk right, be right, stay right. And then you, your, your, your heart hurts and your soul aches to see any of the loss of mankind perishing and going to hell. Isaiah kept silent as long as he could, but in the end, he could not hold on no longer. And when God asked the question, for which he didn't have to ask, Isaiah quickly said, well, here am I. I'll go. I'll go. Will you say to the Lord today, Lord, I'll go. What I want to do is give you an opportunity to say to the Lord, Lord, if you need me, I'm willing, I'll go. Is there one this morning, one of the willing of God's laborers who are freely volunteering their services and say, Lord, if you need me, I'll do it. I'll go. Is there one?